realistic creative effort. Samyakav Vyayama. Yandar Bidzundru. Uh, actually, the Tibetans translate it the same way they translate uh, uh, Virya, Paramita. Virya and Vyayama are really the same uh, meaning, uh, as shown by the way the Tibetans translated it. Okay, so the first two branches of the Eightfold Path, realistic worldview and realistic life purpose, motivation, constitute the super education in wisdom. The next three, which we've done, realistic speech, realistic evolutionary action, body, speech, and mind, and realistic livelihood, how you do that in your own life, in your own social circumstance, and historical circumstance, constitute the super education in ethics. So we've now got wisdom and ethics going. Notice how those two precede realistic meditation. <laughs> you know, the, the, the last two. And then in between, the present six brands, um, you know, so realistic mindfulness and realistic samadhi. And I, and I say realistic remembering slash mindfulness, because I don't actually much that much like the translation mindfulness for smriti or sati in Pali or smriti, which actually just means remembering, memory. It just means memory. So it's truly speaking, it's realistic remembering and realistic samadhi concentration. And the samadhi is just one-pointed uh, thing. But those are the last two. So the way of teaching Buddhism, that Buddhism is just meditation that has been popular in the West, is wrong. It's, meditation is a very key tool in Buddhism, and you cannot have Buddhism without it. You cannot have education without meditation, actually. So there should be medication in schools, not as some religious thing, but as part of learning, part of developing the instrument of your intelligence and of your heart, of your, of your emotional commitment to reality and to others, you know, your ethical commitment. So that's, that those things are essential. So, so, but that's the last, because you have to have your wisdom, open-mindedness, and you have to have your ethical commitment to a proper activity. Uh, you, have, you have to have that. So, um, so now we come to the sixth branch, which is the one we're talking now, or the sixth limb, which is realistic creative effort, samyak vyayama. It is the engine of all three. By the way, you have niyama, yama, and niyama in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Patanjali. And that's the same bunch of verb root as vyayama, vyayama. Same thing, kind of effort and um, aiming of behavior and so forth. And this is the engine of all of the other three. In other words, the ethics, the, wisdom, the science, the ethics, and the, and the psychology, in a way, are the three branches of the Buddhist education. And um, of those three, effort, creative effort, creativity in all of them is, is essential. So it's the engine of all of them. And depression and laziness and... And the hopelessness is the opposite of, of this, this one. But you can't get anywhere if you're hopeless and you're lazy and you're depressed. So it's the engine of all three higher educations or super educations, although it can also be considered part of the super education of mind, of the psychology, which is where the meditation is located. Remember the six transcendent virtues? Realistic creative effort here in the Eightfold Path corresponds to transcendent creativity or transcendent creative effort, virya paramita, in that bodhisattva set of six. In both systems, it is the opposite of despair, depression, lethargy, laziness, hopelessness. Right? Sometimes this is translated as effort by itself. The reason I translate both terms with creativity is that all words for effort Vigor, courage, diligence, enterprise, enthusiasm, etc., that have been tried in his, in his historically, can be used as drivers of negative actions as well as positive ones. You can be, dil you can be a diligent murderer. You can be a courageous thief. You can be a, a vigorous criminal of any kind and so forth. You can be an enterprising corporate person of 
polluting and destroying the planet and so on. So you can use energy and effort in a negative way as well as positive. But this particular samyak vyayama means, means effort in a positive evolutionary direction, in a virtuous, in a skillful direction. You could also be a creative bad guy, as I write, just to read, killer or robber. But we usually esteem creativity as creating something good, something beautiful. So our efforts should be expressions of creativity. Creativity is also naturally associated with art and artfulness, making a better world by educating and improving the self as a help to others. All of these move us in a positive direction. And this is the sixth branch or the sixth of the Eightfold Path, the sixth limb of the octopus, of the be being that is crawling along the eight la la lanes of the superhighway of uh, the fourth uh, friendly fun fact, the, the path, the, the, the fact of the path of educational development, evolutionary educational development. To review, you might have a breakthrough and be inspired that Buddha is as Buddha does. You realize that creating positive, peaceful, harmonious relations with others in the world is the powerful wave of the supreme good, that ethical actions are super pleasant, and that you evolve up through joy and benefit yourself supremely when benefiting others. This also grounds you in the first three of these six transcendent virtues of generosity, justice, and tolerance, with their naturally resultant states of super joy, clear light transparency, and radiance. Those are the states uh, that go along with generosity, justice, and tolerance in the Bodhisattva path. The super education in ethicality and justice follows naturally with realistic speech, realistic evolutionary action, and realistic livelihood. All three of these ethical branches are positive evolutionary actions in that they open your being and move you toward the fun of the infinite lifestyle. They become easy and practical since you don't want to have a way of living that harms others or causes more turbulence in the world because such turbulence distracts you from the peace of the mind devoted to the positive evolution of self and others. It is these steps that unlock the fountain of energetic creativity and courageous determination toward complete joy. The result is that we realize that our life is our art that our art is the boundless love that is the will of the bliss reality, and that it overflows irresistibly and enfolds all others by kindling the inner bliss and beauty they may not have ever been consciously aware of due to the habitual and instinctual error of misknowing self-centered ignorance. That's pretty good. <laughs> I don't have to elaborate, I think. So life is art, art is life, and uh, that is creativity. Creativity, and then heading under the heading of creativity, is essential to the good life. To start, though, we have to realize that creativity is essential to getting something done. In the Buddha's time, he wanted people to start a new way of life, to begin a scientific, psychological, and social ethical revolution, so he, without violence, so he encouraged their creativity and mobilized their creative energy. Before he became Buddha, the Buddha-to-be, Siddhartha's initial creativity manifested as an explanation to his horrified father as to why he would not take his place on the throne as a king of the Shakya nation. He said something akin to, to paraphrase, I, Siddhartha, as king, could only preside over the ordinary subsistence things for my people. Instead, in other words, you know, how they, what they get to eat, what they do, defending them, health, education, welfare, and defense, and so forth. but not so much education, health, welfare, and defense. Instead, I'm going to seek the higher meaning of human life. My dear father, I will not succeed you as king, since I want to help my people and all people and beings solve their real problems, which are suffering, sickness, old age, and death. I think I can do it. So goodbye. I'll be back, but only when I really know what should be done. Not just sit as a judge on the royal throne uh, when people bring their problems. What inspired logic? He essentially said, sure, I could help a few people if I took on the role of king, 
But think of all the people I could help if I overcame the suffering of all beings. If you follow Siddhartha's inspiration here, you will naturally reorder your priorities and make a radical leap out of conventional life, even sometimes entering, as he did, the mendicant way of life. In modern terms, this may look like adopting an educationalist lifestyle. Do nothing but find out what it's all about, and you can essentially catch a glimpse of the possibility of a higher reality. You will find people who inspire you. Maybe you'll meet a Buddha or someone with traces of such enlightenment along the way. As you feel freer, you'll develop sympathy for those bound to the wheel of blind duty, and you'll want to get somewhere and be someone who can eventually bring them along too. Becoming a bodhisattva, an enlightening hero, in, or, or shiro, in training. As mentioned early on in this book, a bodhisattva is an open-minded, an open-hearted, or awake-hearted being who strives to benefit all of those around them over the course of multiple lifetimes until every being is liberated. You might even be inspired to take the bodhisattva vow, to turn your heart inside out and live to benefit all life. And then amazingly find yourself much happier even inside your own heart <laughs> once you turned it inside out. The only prerequisite for being able to do so, of course, is for you to develop a mindset that has the common sense reality that lifetimes are unlimited and that you have an infinite future ahead of you and to realize that this future is inevitably related to other beings, forever interrelated with you. And this sense of boundless future must make sense, not just be a wild leap of faith. Just like it makes sense to you that you should do some exercise, do some yoga, so when, as you get older you will feel better and you'll be healthier, and et cetera, et cetera. So you expect that you, you're motivated toward that goal because you have the sense of the future of yourself in this life, and that's commonsensical to you. So the future one also becomes commonsensical when you take the second law of thermodynamics, the law of the conservation of energy, and you apply that to your own mental energy, your own spiritual and mental energy, and you realize that that cannot be destroyed. It will continue even when it doesn't operate in this body and this brain. It will continue somehow. Some people will then say, well, it continues in my children. But then they might listen to their children who will say, thank you very much. I don't need your brain operating in my brain. I have mine going on in there. And you can influence me, of course, and I'll learn from you, and I'll try to do the best I can, as you did. But I don't need you going on through me. I need you going on in your next life instead. Much better. It will be more free in helping each other that way. Okay, so that's what's called a common sense reality, that lifetimes are unlimited and that you have an infinite future ahead of you and to realize that this future is inevitably related to other beings, forever interrelated with you. Uh, so it's not a wild leap of faith, it's a sensible, boundless sense of boundless future. And it, and it goes along with the sense of boundless and infinite past as well which is respecting yourself as having come from huge experience, in fact, having that huge experience, being aware, in a sense, on your, of your own self on your genetic level, realizing that your genetic level is not just some code put in there by somebody else, some kind of like a mechanical programming. What it is is a residue of your experience. It's the, it's the summary and the quintessence and the summary of what you have learned in other lives to have that code that codes you to have a certain type of body, a certain type of instinct, a certain type of nervous system, and so on, which is much more advantageous to you than when you were a crocodile or a hippopotamus or a worm or something. It's something that enables you at the subtle plane to be closer to your deepest micro essence or something like that. Really amazing idea, but why not? You have infinite time to work on it. Why wouldn't you? You know, we have NVIDIA now making super chips that have like a billion circuits in a tiny little thing, like so tiny they have a billion different options in there. And in other words, in a sense that a kind of an awareness in a chip, 
which then AI can use to like read Shakespeare in 30 seconds, all of Shakespeare's plays in 30 seconds, or three seconds maybe. So why can't we develop a mind like that that can be aware of our micro level of existence and realize that our awareness is permeating our whole system rather than just something going on in our verbal monologue, internal verbal monologue. It involves working to drop out of the conventionally assumed reality of modern culture that life ends in a dying into nothing, period. When we break free of such an attitude, even if we're only subliminally breaking free, that's what I call breaking free from the terminal lifestyle. Like, we have to, this is the last time I'll have a chance to do this and do that and blah, blah, blah. It's because I'm just going to be terminated and it's useless, whatever, so I shouldn't strain too hard to be good because it will be useless, you know, and I can be bad even if I can get away with it because there's no, there's no consequence past whatever benefit, a sensory benefit I get out of it in this life. And the exuberant sense of freedom that receives you supports your newfound infinite lifestyle. So, and that, in a way, I didn't mention it here, but those of you who are philosophy buffs, Nietzsche, among Western philosophers, was definitely a bodhisattva rebirth because he articulated that with his concept of the eternal recurrence, the ewige, I don't know the German, the ewige, wieder something, wieder gehen or something like that. In other words, you should only do things that you would be willing to repeat eternally. So they're so great to do them. In the actual doing, it's so wonderful, you wouldn't mind just repeating it forever. That's the eternal recurrence. doesn't mean you just become obsessive compulsive and just do repeat one thing only forever, but it means you only do things you'd be willing to do that with. So that's sort of like the categorical imperative become an aesthetic joy, in a way, put it that way, rather than just do, do unto, which is the golden rule, really, right? Kant's categorical imperative is just the golden rule, only do what you would be willing to do in, universally in all, such, all situations. So that's the infinite lifestyles when you live like that. The belief that we just end at the time of death is the ultimate killer of creativity and depressant. It is the true meaning of modern depression, ep epidemic of depression and suicide and so on. The utterly irrational and unevidenced belief that something can become nothing is the doorway to despair. You must free yourself. At first it seems like liberation, like libertarian. Oh, I can do whatever because it won't have any consequence. But on the other hand, whatever I do is useless. So therefore it leads to despair. You must free yourself of that prison of nihilism to burst into the life energized by altruism, to find the bodhisattva will to optimize reality, to love everyone as much as possible, and to have them love you as you both become enlightened through wisdom, the, door to, the scientific doorway to creativity. We should all go there and do that before we contemplate too much and escape into artificial detachment. Within the bodhisattva realm, creativ creativity is useful at all levels. You know, the, and this is what, what is uh, the greatness of creativity as well as of heroic uh, enterprise is, is that it's like the man, I always say, it's like the, the, the herald who ran from Marathon to Athens and then died after he delivered the warning to the Athenians that the Persians were coming inevitably and they should prepare to defend themselves. And the reason he died is that he pushed his body, his will to be a savior of his people was stronger than the physical ability of his body to sustain such a long run, a marathon run. And so that's why we call them marathons, you know, the 26-mile thing. And so that gave him a power that even overwhelms his, the ability of the tissues and the pump in his heart and brain and whatever it was in his, the organs of his body. So I'm not, I'm not saying that creativity is something that therefore we should kill ourselves. Well, I'm just saying that when your motivation is to do it for the team, to do it for the fam, to do it for the nation, to do it for the world, for all beings, the huge energy of the need of all these beings gives you greater energy in whatever you do and create and meditate on. And 
Therefore, you are much more powerful than if the only motive is to benefit yourself. So that's a, that's a smaller need. You, you magnify the need, you magnify the energy with which you wish to satisfy the need. That's all. It's a very brilliant psychological thing underlying the Bodhisattva method of becoming enlightened. So now I, now I, then I turn to Buddhist art, and which is a, a favorite theme of mine, and so should be of all of us. Enlightened art, and it doesn't. And in a way, I'm just calling it Buddhist art because this is supposed to be about Buddhism. But really, it's enlightenment art or enlightening art, because you don't have to be. A, because unfortunately, when people, you know, it's like the original title of this book was going to be "Buddhas Have More Fun," was going to be my original title, because I didn't mean Buddhists have more fun. I know a lot of miserable Buddhists, and they don't have their they have their ups and downs like everybody else, and so. I'm Buddha is what I meant, but then I realized you can't use the word Buddha because people will think that, oh, that's Buddhist. But Buddha wasn't a Buddhist. There was no such thing as Buddhism when Buddha was teaching. It was just, he was just educating people, period. Later, they called that curriculum and its institutions Buddhism, which is not that harmful and it's not that bad, but the point is, it's primarily not a religion, but it's a basically a university. It's basically an educational system and an educational culture. Actually, it's what it is, not a cult of blind faith as religion is normally defined as. It is not that. So returning to the creativity of Buddha, actually I shouldn't have called this Buddhist art. In the next edition I'll say Buddha art. That's what I'll do. Stop it with the, I didn't put all these categories. The headings, you know, that the editors did that to make it seem more bite-sized for people, which is good, actually. But they shouldn't have put ist. They're also pushing me into Buddhist. Buddha art. Returning to the creativity of Buddha, the first thing he had to do after his blissful enlightenment was to help people try to imagine a world of bliss. The true reality of the third noble truth or friendly fun fact is nirvana. The cessation of suffering, freedom from suffering, when all they had ever allowed themselves to experience was suffering. The more intelligent people know full well that temporary, circumstance-dependent pleasures are impermanent and inevitably give rise to dissatisfaction, suffering frustration, and frustration, and that the addictive search for more such pleasures then just prolongs frustration, How could, with occasional moments of relief. How could they even imagine such a creative thing as a perfect eternal bliss, something they can personally experience with no sense of loss of their previous embodiment or mind? How can you imagine that? Be permanently in a state of orgasm and yet still walking around and shopping in the supermarket. How can anybody imagine that? It's not easy. To open their minds to this reality, inconceivable for them, Buddha had to become an artist starting with the subatomic energies on up design of his own body, and then moving on to the performance art of magical visionary effects, elegant scientific explanations, poetic verses, narrative literature, and so forth, to help people imagine the experience of states somehow suggesting the reality of nirvana as the actual reality of life. The only the the non-nirvanic part of life is 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 only an illusion, and the reality of it is nirvana. That everyone everything is made of nirvana in a way you could almost say, although that's very hard to kind of grasp. Also, it sounds very complicated and highfalutin, but you can say that. So but once it's made of nirvana, then samsara and nirvana are the same thing. If you know them, they are utterly different. If you don't know them. Similarly, in our more modern times, great art, whether Buddhist or not, uh, at least I'm trying to undo the religion idea of Buddhism here, quote Buddhist, unquote, or not, lifts its viewer or hearer or feeler out of their habitual reactions to sense experiences into a melting of habitual postures into beauty, seeing an unexpected higher joy in a quality of thereness or isness in whatever object they contemplate. It therefore expands the experiencer's ability at first to imagine the inconceivable grace of reality, the amazing grace of reality, 
and eventually to experience it. In a way, you could say in the context of Europe that the mystics, in their, given the limitations of human experience allowed to people in the authoritarian European, violence-dominated European societies, the mystics were very all too often burned at the stake, punished, censured, tortured in the Inquisition, put in some horrible chambers and really given a hard time. So they eventually became artists. Then the artists were also impoverished and also abused and dealt with badly. But gradually, 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 then you get Picasso, <laughs> who gets to be an oligarch practically because his art is so appreciated. But these, these are basically mystics, these people. They see things more deeply. They feel them more deeply. They enjoy themselves articulating that just for their own pleasure initially. But then this somehow opens up the people who view it and who experience it and so on. But the real transmission is from the open-heartedness of the mystical artist, even though they're not thinking at all in a didactic way of reaching anybody. They're just enjoying seeing it that way, or painting it that way, or sculpting it that way, or singing it that way. But when they do it without thinking about, I'm getting something out of this, it's just flowing through them, then it automatically lifts the heart of the observer. So it therefore expands the experiencer's ability at first to imagine the inconceivable grace of reality and eventually to experience it. <clears throat> In individual vehicle Buddhism, that's not the universal vehicle, but the individual vehicle Buddhism, Buddha's teachings primarily focused on the priest and warrior classes. He let the mainly male seekers, somewhat chauvinist, self-centered, highly intelligent persons, imagine the bliss of nirvana as a state outside the world. He knew they could not imagine experiencing the world of differentiated objects as configurations of sheer bliss. But they could think of disembodied states of various kinds as possible states of bliss, or perhaps somewhat preferable to, as perhaps somewhat preferable to, say, a simple state of annihilation. So he taught them, or let us rather say he allowed them to interpret his teaching as revealing a kind of extinction of embodied experience, a state of nirvana apart from the samsaric cycle. He did hint quite directly that the escapist effort was not the final answer with his teaching of what are known as the four formless states called infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothing whatsoever, and beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, by clearly stating that none of them is nirvana, and demonstrating the fact of this in the process of his dying, by demonstrating a departure from his body into the highest heaven zone of supreme divine embodiment, the, what they call the akanishta, not lesser than anything, literally that means, not smaller than anything else, rather than into a formless state. And again, that people can't get that, I know, just from that statement, really. But my editor didn't push me to make it more explicit. So what I have to say is those formless states are all disembodied states. And I think I mentioned already in one of the previous lectures, if you've been following this along, that those four states are attainable even by an egotist. And what they will tend to do is they would, might tend to be reborn as a deity of those formless realms, which apparently have an infinite population of those realms because nobody has a body. There's no race extensa, or the race extensa, you know, the thing that is, you know, space filling thing is not there except in such a super subtle level that there's infinite room. So, but that is not nirvana, that is not extinction, that is just a type of disembodied embodiment, an embodiment in a disembodied state, let's say, but through a subtle energy in a disembodied state. And it creates tremendous mental dullness by a person, and therefore they fall from there eventually. And even, it, we would say eventually, and in the Buddhists will say like a, you say a, a, like a billion years there, as a planet evolves or deteriorates, you're there, and then when you emerge in a lower form, you do so on another planet in another cycle in another universe. They would say something like that if they wanted to fit it into our notion of cycles of universes. But to the person in that state, however, there is no sense of time, because there's no body, there's no breathing, there's no heartbeat, 
there's no getting to a sense of getting to a future. They don't have a sense of time because there's no, there's nothing to measure time by. So it's like I experienced that once when I was in a den. The only time I ever had sodium pentothal, since I was kind of consciously aware of what I was feeling, I must have had it when I had tonsillitis. So I must have been knocked out in anesthetically. But once in a dentist chair here in Woodstock, I got. I had a bad tooth pulling, so I got knocked out. But secretly, I wanted the guy to knock me out because I was thinking of total relaxation of really being, feeling like I was in nothingness. I wanted that. And I was so frustrated because all, I, all it was was a kind of buzz of losing consciousness. And then I was immediately being kicked out of the chair by a nurse saying, bite down on this and sit down and you've been there for half an hour and blah, blah, and somebody else needs to come and see the dentist. And then I had to go to a waiting room. So there was no sense of time in the state of total unconsciousness whatsoever. Just like sometimes you'll fall asleep and then bring you awake right up or you might have a dream just as you're waking, be aware of a dream just as you're waking up. So it's frustrating in the sense of you don't feel the rest of being totally like letting go of everything. And, you know, except in the process of entering it and emerging from it. So when you're, when you're completely unaware like that, there's no sense of time. So for the being in it, it's instantaneous, their existence as a formless realm de deity, and yet measured by outside beings, which are beings who are in time, their hearts are beating, they're doing whatever they're doing, you've been gone. I mean, they have no idea who you are because you've been gone from the world like a minute time. Like Thoreau had a wonderful thing in his book, Walden, where he told the parable, which I think he got from a Hindu book, of a guy who wanted to make a gift of the ultimate walking stick for someone. And he spent aeons, and he was a semi-divine being. And he said, Vishvakarma, I think, the cosmic, the divine artificer, uh, the divine artisan. And he selected a tree over many, many millions of years. And then he carved it for millions of years. And then by the time he finally finished the ultimate walking stick, the deity he wanted to make it for had long passed away and the different universes had evolved and devolved and in between. So then he didn't know what to do with it. It's a wonderful little thing he has in Walden, showing how his imagination was expanded by his encountering of Buddhist and Hindu literature in translation in the 19th century, in the, 19th, the 1830s. So... So, so and then when he said Buddha demonstrated that a departure from his body into the highest heaven zone of supreme divine embodiment, the Akanista, rather than into a formless state. So this refers to the sutta in Pali, even of Theravada Buddhism, uh, of where the Buddha attains parinirvana, which where they, people wrongly translate final nirvana, whereas the do, pari doesn't mean final, it's not a time word. Pari as a prefix means total. So total nirvana, so it just means expanded to be everything rather than just finally left his body and disappeared into nothingness, which is what people think when they think of the Buddha dying. So when he was um, doing that, Ananda, his close attendant, who was very sensitive to his states of being but was not yet enlightened, and Mahakashyapa, who was a, the leader of the community of mendicants and who was enlightened, were standing there as the Buddha was stopping breathing and so on. And they were kind of empathetically following his states of consciousness. But one was more deep than the other. So then when the Buddha reached the top of the formless realm, in other words, that level of mental subtlety, of one-pointedness, then Ananda lost track of his presence because he sort of disappeared into a point, you could say, seemed to, to Ananda. So then Ananda turned to Kasyapa and said, Mahakashapa and said, oh, he's gone now. Because that's what he imagined the opposite of being in the world would be. And Kashyapa said, no, not yet. He's just gone into that deepest state of subtlety. Wait a little while. Really? You know, Ananda was so sensitive the Buddha couldn't find him kind of in his, in his empathy. But then he did feel him coming back down through these exalted meditative states. And then into the form realm states, the realms of pure form, pure matter, the Brahma realms, down to all the way to the boundary between the realms of the Brahma realm of pure form, the lowest one, the state of immeasurable love, and the desire realm states, the less pure ones. 
and then he stopped there and kind of coming back toward embodiment. And then he went back up again through the four formless states and the 16 layers of the form realm of the Brahma heavens. And then he seemed to disappear at the, in the same place where the god Brahma was, and which was puzzling to Ananda. Because, and he didn't really get it, but Mahakashapa said, now he's gone. But what that means is what, live, what lives in that plane is the Brahma deity a little below. It's divided in two halves. And then there's a vein, you could call it the event horizon of the formless realm, the sort of black hole formless realm where space collapses. And on that event horizon, in that realm of infinite energy, you have all the Buddha lands, the purest heavenly places. So the, then Buddha, has, Buddha becomes Amitabha, boundless light. He becomes Amitayas, boundless life. He becomes Akshobhya, he becomes Vairochana, he becomes Ratnasambhava, he becomes all the, the so-called contemplative you know, divine Buddhas uh, in, the Buddha, in their Buddha lands, you know, in their Buddha universes, which all exist in a sort of high heavenly, thought of as high heaven from the earth, but actually in a, in a realm where dimensions are completely warped in, of time and space, and where therefore pure Buddha, you know, closest possible to the Buddha state that you can be in a form embodiment, an eternal or permanent form embodiment, seemingly or relatively permanent or whatever you want to call it, an inconceivable grace state on the event horizon of the sort of formlessness realm. So maybe you could call it the, the place of white holes, if you follow some of our later quantum physical people. The place of white holes, not black holes. On the edge of the black hole. I love it, I love it, I love it. So, so that, that, that's what I'm referring to, but no one would ever get it, I confess. By clearly stating none of them is nirvana, those formless realms are not nirvana, in other words, he said. You, it's not just obliterating yourself. And by clear, just to suffer, you're obliterating suffering, but not yourself. And, and then also by demonstrating the fact of this in the process of his quote-unquote dying, by demonstrating a departure from his body into the highest heaven zone of supreme divine embodiment, the Akanista, rather than into a formless state. That's where Krishna comes from. That's where Brahma dwells. That's where Shiva is in his deepest form and so forth. All of those, that's where the highest deities are in our sense of they are there. Before, but no, nobody and none of them whom are omnipotent, by the way. They're very clear, Buddhism is very clear. None of them are the creator. Everyone is a creator, in other words. Before that, even as witnessed in the Pali discourses, he performed numerous miraculous, extraordinary performance art events, such as multiplying his body. That's a great one that I love when there was a series of miracles he did in his old age, Shakyamuni, when all the kings of all the city-states that were in India at that time, there wasn't one single empire at that time. There were some bigger and smaller ones, but they were city-states, like Athens, Sparta, Corinth, you know, like, like in Greece and, and in Persia at that time. Well, the Persians had an empire, but otherwise, pretty much throughout Eurasia, there were city-states in, in the Axial Age. And... Uh, Well, I forgot how long I was going to say that. Uh, what, was, what was I reading? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And then when the day came when his father, who, who, who sadly, the father, who was the grandfather of his son Rahu, who had by that time become a mendicant himself, so he couldn't even hand it over to his grandson, and he was still serving as the king, but he was retire, almost retiring. And then he retired to someone in a different lineage who wasn't a good king, and then different political problems happened. But anyway, his father made the offering and asked to see a miracle. And uh, because he was in a context of performing miracles for two weeks in the New Year's fortnight. And um, the miracle he showed to his father was two Buddhas, he was sitting there on this, uh, in his throne his chair in this city in a big amphitheater a big huge field of, of uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people and all the kings of the region 16 kings and uh, 
And uh, he then, two Buddhas came out, so there were three of them. And then out of the heart of each of those three, two more came out. And then two more came out, two more came out. And finally, everybody in the whole field had a perception of every atom was Shakyamuni Buddha. So there was an infinite number of Buddhas in their vision. And he did that sort of piece of performance art, you could say. He made that miracle. And I always, it's not said in the text, but I always imagine him saying to his father, well, dad, I didn't conquer the world as you had hoped I would become an emperor by conquering everybody else. I didn't do that. But I'm sort of all over it, wouldn't you say? <laughs> because when they say everybody saw Buddha in every atom, that also means that in every atom of their own body, they felt they were kind of crawling with Buddha. You know, there was a Buddha everywhere, in other words, in the universe. So I love, I like that story. And uh, 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 where, where am I here? So yeah, these are the miraculous things that he did. That's right. Multiplying his body. That's where I am. Levitating to the height of seven palm trees while still talking. Producing various illusions. Manifesting magical emanations. Like he showed a giant the equivalent of something like a planetarium at the beginning of the Vimalakirti. He showed all kinds of miracles. Even Vimalakirti does, who himself is a miraculous emanation of a, a different Buddha from another universe called Akshobhya and, um, in the Vimalakirti Sutra. Or letting people see different deities that are normally invisible. That's when he tripped down a stairway to earth from the heaven of 33. That's Indra's heaven. But the Odin, Indra is like Odin, Zeus sort of figure in the Indian thing, because they have various layers of de divine beings. With forms of the deities, Brahma and Indra, in full view of the humans waiting for him. In various ways, in other words, he creatively expanded their normal perceptions to hint that there was another way of seeing this world. He also creatively taught students the Jataka tales, that's to say how he behaved in former lives as different kinds of animals and different kinds of humans. The folk art stories illustrating the ethical good. Also teaching, which is sort of like the original Walt Disney old yeller type or the happy deer or Bambi the deer, you know. He told stories like that as he having been that in a previous life when he was a deer, when he was a snet. He often is the king head deer, but anyway, he's, he tells those kind of stories. Those were the Jataka tales. He also teaching a Darwinian type interconnection between human and animal life forms, dramatizing for those priest class male chauvinists that they too had been different genders in previous lives and even different kinds of animals. He taught that part of his enlightenment experience was his remembering of all his previous lives as different animals and deities and even demons as a bodhisattva messiah to be. In that way, he introduced the concept of a bodhisattva to his mendicant followers, even though they were dualists who weren't seeking to be, uh, in where they weren't seeking universal responsibility, they just were trying to save themselves. But he still gave them a way to do that and planted the hint that they might enjoy being messianic bodhisattvas. He did so only hinting that we all have to do the same, refraining from asking most of those sensitive freedom-seeking individuals to undertake such an evolutionary progression over many lives to achieve both release from suffering themselves and full presence to other beings as a Buddha. However, to a small circle of advanced students in his universal vehicle assemblies, he didn't hold back the fact that they too would have to tread the bodhisattva path for countless lives to become a perfect Buddha themselves for the sake of others, not only a saint for their own escape from suffering. In the divine histories, Divya Avadana, in the divine histories, the Divya Avadana it's called, there is a story about the venerable Upagupta, the fourth leader of the mendicant community after Buddha, that illustrates this artistic effort. Well, you know, this is kind of a long story. There's several long stories here that I love. But it's a little too long. I think I will start here on page 115 for the next, uh, next one. I will start with the Divya Vedana story of Upagupta and Mara, which has to do with Buddhist theatrical art. But I will quickly tell another... Uh, uh, no, I will leave it at this story about the miraculousness of a Buddha being and the continuous presence of a Buddha.
basically redefining, you know, the showing the Mahayana redefinition of the uh, samsara nirvana duality, where samsara is nirvana, that is to say, the life world, this ordinary life world, is the extraordinary world of bliss, of nirvana. It, that's what it really is. It doesn't change a thing. But, it, but, but your knowing of it changes completely how you live it. And you become a Buddha being alive, sharing infinite life with beings who feel they only have a little one and they're fighting to keep it. And, and sometimes, therefore, doing harmful things to others in that sense of self-definition. So I'm going to end with that definition of the Mahayana, where this is nirvana. And right now, and already, and as one Indian guru said to me the other day when I said I was waiting for Shambhala, for you know, sort of more new age heaven on earth, and I thought it, I think it should be next week. And he said, yeah, well, he thought it should be last week. <laughs> he said, which I really liked. I think that's really great. Because actually it already was last week. It was last millennium. It was thousands of years ago to people who knew and know that. But for ignorant people such as myself, with still ignorance, it's like I'm waiting for it, or I'm working to get to it, or whatever, or I'm worried to worry, oh, maybe I say now I'm working to find it here. I sort of know by inference that it's here, but I don't experience it as here, and that makes me frustrated. So it's very good to have that non-duality just as a challenge, hanging over as a challenge to the fact that I think I have to get somewhere else, I have to change what's here in some way. I don't see it as nirvana, but the great authorities tell me it is nirvana, and they tell me I can rationally understand that. And although when I get to the moment of understanding, I may go beyond the duality of rational and irrational. I don't just become irrational, but I go beyond the duality of the two, and maybe that's where you find the amazing grace, put it that way. So, so um, an amazing grace, and being, f feeling grace is to enter the heart of Jesus now, if you're in the Christian terms, and feeling saved. And already there now, they have, a, they have the doorway to this, not this kind of non-duality. But they don't have the inferential interpretation of it. They just think it's something irrational, but that feels good. But that's not as good as it could be when it is something scientific that feels good, and therefore rational. And, and beyond, and be, it's rational to be beyond the rational, irrational duality. In other words, put it that way. That's where you get AI. That's where you. That's where you get beyond on and off. You know, you get on and off simultaneously. Something like that. Okay. Anyway, all the best on that, and we'll pick up from there on that page of one fifteen uh, next time. And uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Piotr and Paulina, the engineers and the managers, and uh, may we all quickly become enlightened, all of us, as fast as we can, in order to develop the ability to help others become, as soon as possible, just like us, equal to us, equally happy, equally free of suffering, and equally able to share that also in an infinite, endless, instantaneous and simultaneous wave of uh, well-being and bliss and delight in, in the world. That's our dedication. Okay, get what D and you do, Dodge and Giant, Dodger and Nitro and Chijamala, but they are